Welcome to the Water Table Podcast. We're excited today. It's our 100th episode. We're actually on site at Iowa State University. So thank you for being here and to uh, to just be part of this. I don't really want to call it a historic event because we have this little this little podcast, but for us at the Water Table, it's, it's an exciting time. So thanks for being here to all three of you. Thanks for the thanks, opportunity. Rip. Dr. Matt Helmers is joining us. Dr. Helmers was our first guest on the podcast and uh, has had maybe two or three other times that you've joined us. And we talk a lot about a lot of different things that you're involved with, but basically um, water quality. Uh, Kelly Blair is joining us. Kelly joined us before and talked about her farm. She's a fourth generation farmer um, and is involved in the water recycling project and the, which is funded here by uh, Iowa EPA and and soybean. And I'm not sure who else is. Idols as well. Okay. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. And uh, so it'll be fun to to continue to learn about that, talk a little bit more about that. And Jacob Hansecker from Hands On Excavating is joining us, another frequent guest of the podcast. <laughs> and I shouldn't just uh, say thank you to, to Dr. Helmers, but also to you for how uh, just available you've been to us and really appreciate it. Um, your business has grown a lot. You're, um, and when it comes to installing bioreactors and installing um, a lot of the water quality things, probably, um, if not one of, maybe the leader in, uh, in world drainage in regards to uh, what you've done with water quality devices. So I think, I think we all are um, somewhat indebted to you and your, your business for what you've been willing to do um, and, and be involved with. So let's get started and just talk about the future of, of uh, water quality in agriculture. And, um, you know, all of you have been involved for so many years now, but and seeing where we're currently at and, and wh where are we headed? Maybe we'll start with you, Dr. Helmers, and in kind of the broad scope and in general, where are we headed with with the water quality in agriculture, and then we'll yeah. get a little deeper I'm, into that. I mean, I think that the the concern about water quality, you know, nitrogen and phosphorus in our water is, is not going away. Um, as we think about the whole upper Midwest, the drainage is so beneficial for our crop production, but it does, uh, is, a, is a mechanism for delivery of that nitrate that moves below the plant, plant root zone to get to downstream water body. So I think there's just gonna be more emphasis on how we manage water from our drainage systems on the landscape with things like control drainage or drainage water recycling, and then how we can implement edge of field practices, saturated buffers, bioreactors, wetlands. You know, I think the, the you know, the willingness of, of Kelly and, and AJ to put in a drainage water recycling system, um, you know, for us to understand that practice. And then for, for Jacob, for the work that he's done with the batch and build efforts, I think that um, his, his uh, company has done more for more for installation of bioreactors and saturated buffers than any other drainage company in the, I can say the world, because I think that, uh, you know, the world leader, I, I don't know how many he's put in. And I think back, I think we, we worked together on maybe your second bioreactor, if I'm not mistaken, May of, of 2018, uh, we put a bioreactor in north, northeast of, of Ames. And I think uh, we just did that one ourselves, so, but he's advanced a lot, a lot since then. Mm -hmm, for sure. And you know, as you as you share that, and I, you know, first question that comes to mind really is for you, Kelly, around when you you're doing something unique with uh, with your recycling. Maybe it's not completely unique, but it is to a lot of people that you would come in contact with, and especially the non-farm community. When you have the opportunity, how do those conversations go? And what you know, what kind of what what kind of uh, questions do you get? And do you feel that uh, that that that's met with a positive? response? I think there's a lot of curiosity. Um, like you said, not in central Iowa irrigation, if they see an irrigation pivot going up, it's like, <laughs> what in the world are they doing? But um, there's been a lot of curiosity around it. It's been really neat to see other farmers come out and, and say, we want to put one in and we want to look at yours and, and see what you guys did. And we have some advice on, you know, things that worked for us and things that maybe took a while and, and, and learning experiences, which is all about um, basically everything that we do on the farm. Um, but I think the best part of doing it was 
I went to a farm conference, uh, Iowa Soybean, and somebody from IDALS came up and asked me, do you want to be a part of this project? And I said, sign us up. And then it was like, okay, where do we go? All the real details. Like when I got home, AJ's like, well, okay, so what, do, what all do we need? And I was like, it was, this is just, our name is on the list. I was like, that's all we got. But um, here we are, I think, was it five years? I think it was, yeah, <laughs> quite a few years later. But five yeah. years, and we, we finally got to use it. Last year, for the first time, it's filling right now for the 2024 corn crop that's going going to go in. Seems like pretty soon here, and uh, I, th I think we're still learning about it, um, and we're really excited to see the results and and hopefully tell a little bit more about what it's going to do for yields, what it's going to do for water quality um, from here. I think one thing that we see, at least I and in, would be interested to get some feedback on this, but is that the non-farming community, our city cousins, never realize the technology changes that are happening in agriculture and probably are happening quicker in agriculture than other sectors. I think, you know, when you're involved in something, you always don't see the other side. So it, maybe that's an unfair comment, but for sure where we've come in agriculture over, you know, the last 40 or 50 years, but even the last five or six. Um, and do you guys see that? And do you have those conversations um, in your daily lives with just people that are surprised? And you kind of answer that, but probably over to you, Jacob, or, you know, in regards to this is what we're doing. We're putting these biochip reactions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, it, and it's the, you know, we farm, farm some as well, and it's across the board, whether it's the management and the, and the application of the seed and the nitrogen, and, and it all kind of goes hand in hand because the, the farmer on the, on the application side is doing this precision and they're doing, putting their, the amount of nitrogen and the amount of phosphorus and fertilizer and, and, and shoot even now, even chemical with uh, optical sensing that we're going to spray this weed here and only that weed. And all of that ties together with water quality. Uh, the less the less we put out there, the less we have to manage on the backside as it runs through our, uh, through the soil and through our tile, and and we get to manage it lots of different ways. So the the, f but expressing that to individuals, uh, our city cousins, uh, have one in, one example. Uh, we were working on a bioreactor just uh, north of Des, Mo Des Moines, and they we had to go through. <laughs> Things got a little mixed up. We went through a an area that we that we were told the farmer had permission to go through. The farmer didn't necessarily have permission to go through. The landowner came out, what are you doing? And then we explained, well, this is what we're doing. They said, okay, well, if this is, if we're doing a bioreactor here and we're creating a water quality process, and that was just after Senate file 512 had passed uh, and we had been that had been in the news uh, and we're talking about how we're benefiting water quality like okay that sounds great if this would have been a tile line i would have been fighting you but with with what you're doing doing beneficial process go ahead um, and so that sticks in my mind that once we educate them that we're we're and educate everybody it's not just our city cousins that don't know what we're doing it's it's a lot of farmers out there also that aren't quite familiar with these processes yet and and getting these batch and builds uh the biggest the biggest hurdle with these batch and builds is people knowing about them and people signing up and understanding that we have a lot of support uh from all forms of government and private industry that we can get these done and we can get them done effectively and they can't they're not going to be a detriment to the pr to the process um but getting the farmer to understand that is the biggest hurdle in everything. Um, and it's, it's definitely changed as from the first one we put in years ago. <laughs> how long did it take? How long did it, it take to get that first one approved? From the first from one, the, the farmer, uh, the landowner, uh, the farmer and landowner, they were, um, it took them about three and a half years from the first time they thought, hey, they kind of found a little bit of, this is right at the very infancy of these, but three and a half years from FSA visits and NRCS visits and site visits and designs and redesigns and redesigns, and, and then we finally got it put in. Um, and, and most farmers won't do that. Most farmers will not spend three and a half years trying to bird dog something and get this done. These guys, this particular uh, farmer was, they were very, 
passionate about it and this is what they wanted to do, which was very fortunate. And that's what got, got us started uh, on all this as well. But now with the batch and build process and the, and the support we have from universities and from private companies and from the uh, government entities, we can burn these things through pretty fast. And, and it takes, it takes a little work off. The farmer has to sign a pile of papers at the FSA office, or oftentimes the, the uh, batch and build coordinator will come out to their, come out to their kitchen table, sign away, and, and then we get to work. As you, as you see these new practices, you know, how that went with, with and how hard it was, and now you're thinking and you're ahead of that, thinking of new things you can do. Question for you, Dr. Helmers. Do you ever get frustrated with the process? Do you get frustrated with <laughs> yeah, with people yeah. and like why uh, can't we move faster? Yeah, I, I definitely I definitely get frustrated uh, for sure. There are there there are some uh, issues with getting um, saturated buffers, bioreactors, wetlands in place that I think there are barriers. Uh, like Jacob talked about, you know, certainly there's a barrier of getting landowner interest, but then we we really have to figure out a way to all get on the same page that we need these practices. You know, sometimes I get accused of, you know, you only think we need edge of field practices. No, we need it all. We need infield nitrogen management. We need things like cover crops and, and land use, but we need these edge of field practices. And certainly, you know, IDALS in Iowa, Iowa Department of Ag and Land Stewardship is a leader in that and understanding that. But, um, you know, I think that there's, uh, uh, we all need to, yeah, I, I get frustrated for sure. You know, I, I do think though about the technology development that we've seen you know over the last 50 years i think it's important you know this week in the last week or so we lost uh, dr jim faust that was a real leader in the drainage industry on on corrugated pipe and and plows um, we think to the gps technology that you know kind of has come about with getting installation and then we think about these edge of field practices you know 10 years ago um, there were a couple saturated buffers, bioreactor, or actually a couple bioreactors, saturated buffers were really just in their infancy, you know, and, and certainly wetlands kind of similarly. But, you know, so the advances there over the last 10 to 20 years are pretty amazing. Um, we need to do a lot more. And I think many of us get frustrated, but it's also a time to look and, and kind of be excited about what might be happening in the future with things like the drainage water re recycling and how we manage water on our landscape, both for you know environmental benefit, but the production of, of our agricultural crops as well. Yeah, I, I'm glad you mentioned real quick, a lot there that I yeah, want yeah. to talk about, but... Um, <laughs> Uh, Dr. Jim Faust, um, he designed corrugated pipe. And when you think of that and you think of uh, industry, which is the industry that Princeco is in, obviously, um, there wouldn't be an industry without that de design. Maybe somebody else would have done it, but he did do it. And so it really shows when we, we talk about, you know, we're frustrated with things moving at the pace they do, our industry is still pretty young. You know, yeah. drainage itself obviously is has been around for a long, long time. But in regards to the plastic pipe and where we've taken it and how much faster you can do things because of plastic pipe and um, you know pattern drainage, things like that, it's a, it's a young industry. And so I think we have to remember that and how we move things forward. But um, the other question that I had that really I spurred just in this conversation, I hadn't really thought about this because when you come from Minnesota like we do, we always get frustrated with our city cousins. I, th I think I look at people that are from the city in Minnesota as different than the people from the city in <laughs> Iowa. Uh, they frustrate me more. Um, and what I mean by that is I, th I think the past in Iowa, and correct me if I'm wrong, has been that there's always been a right to farm and a right to manage your water. That is not true in minnesota the the second statement for sure um you don't necessarily have it's not it's not something that has just it's a legacy um it's a legacy in iowa because it's been going on for so long it isn't in minnesota and do you see that changing just with how um demographics change with how um, more people are separated from the farm they don't have uh family they don't have you know grandparents that live on the farm anymore like they used to. You see that changing in yeah. Iowa also. 
Uh, yes and no, I guess. Uh, you know, I think I think there are, you know, um, people are a little bit further removed from the farm. But I think as we look at it, still so many have some tie to some of our small communities or to, to the rural area. And so, and I think that there is, you know, within Iowa, uh, certainly there are some divides, but there's a lot of support for um, the types of practices that we talked about. You know, I think within our Within the urban sector, um, you know, those people are supportive of many of these practices because they understand that it can and help with water. You know, some of the things like wetlands help with, you know, other things beyond just water quality with, with habitat. So I'm, I'm not as pessimistic on that side of it than maybe some of the others might be. Um, but because I think there is a lot of interest if we, if we think to some of the, you know, the ballot initiatives that have been on in Iowa with uh, uh, water, land, and legacy, you know, that, that ballot initiative passed, I think, you know, 60-40 uh, to if there was ever a sales tax increase that, that a portion of those dollars go toward conservation-related efforts. And so, you know, that was, that was urban people as well as rural people voting, voting for that. So I think there's, there's still opportunities for education across both sides, uh, but I do think that there's a lot of support for the practices. There's probably, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, some of the urban um, uh, residents are, you know, want it to go faster. But I think all of us would agree right. we'd like to see some things go faster too. So, right. um, yeah, yeah, good. Probably a question for all of you: what what practices do you see coming down the line that have the most promise? Um, either either added practices to what we're already doing, or some new new things when it comes to water quality and sustainability. I think what I've seen in practicing drainage, and I get a lot of questions about what, what can I do here and, and how can I manage this runoff. And I've probably had, I mean, we have conversations about bioreactor saturated buffers quite often, but I think, uh, um, and Dr. Helmers and I have had this conversation a few times, but micro wetlands that are, are kind of coming on that, that can, we're not going to have to create or, or we don't need to create a wetland for an entire watershed, but it might be my farm site is draining to this area. How can I manage that? I don't want my, whether I have runoff from my livestock lot or from my compost pile or from, from my, um, silage pile, uh, how, how can I manage that? And I think the, uh, I think some creating holding areas and, and opportunities for those, those microchasms of, of runoff areas and managing those as we, as we run them down. And it might not be a situation for a saturated buffer, or it might not be for a, a bioreactor because there, there's really not any tile drainage in that, but there's still overland flow. How do we manage that on a smaller scale and look at that to on a case by case basis instead of an entire watershed basis? We don't need a 80 acre wetland and 160 acres of CRP that we take out of production and that we put into this, but can we do this in, in a little bit of a more, and that can go for an urban setting as well. And we do a lot of it in the urban settings that we do these wetlands. How can we transition that onto f farm properties as well? We've had a lot of conversations about that. That uh, that answer reminds me. I got to degrass a little bit and asked you if you were frustrated. So I'm going to tell you about one of my frustrations. Um, so my wife and I own a small farm, um, 80 acres next to where she grew up and we uh we rent that farm and um cash rent and i got a call from one of the local agencies and said have you ever thought about putting that farm in crp and and i like to hunt too and so i hadn't really thought of it but i said well, i could i don't know what tell me why you want me to and uh and it wasn't um, the, the federal level calling me, but they, they knew the figures, and this is what you could um, get for, for uh, CRP payments. But we have a one-time payment from the local watershed um, on top of that that we would pay up front of $500 an acre. So now if you start 
talking about that plus what I'm going to get. And, you know, it's like, well, maybe I should think about that. But what the frustration part for me being in the industry I'm in is that's a temporary fix. That That's going to create better water quality in CRP for the 10 years it's in CRP. But why aren't we looking at other ways of doing things um, that have, you know, a legacy improvement mm -hmm. and I, th so. I think you know along with that i mean there's going to be frustrations with everything but what excites me about especially where we are, we're at because we need tile drainage in order to farm Absolutely. but we need resiliency as well and so you know when you're thinking about that soil and usually in the spring is pretty wet so we need it tiled but if you know if we're holding it and going to be able to put it back on in the dry months or whatever it's exciting to think about okay we're creating a long-term system that could potentially help both yield soil water quality, habitat. We've seen a lot of birds on the pond already, um, things like that. And I mean, I think that resiliency is key of using the systems we have in place to make them better. Um, in our area, we see a lot of tile mains that are gonna need upgrades. <laughs> we just talked about this before yeah. we started yeah. recording, but I think there's a lot of opportunities as those upgrades go in. Costs are gonna be also a big thing with landowners though. Um, as those upgrades go in place, you gotta get everybody on board to do that as well. So. Yeah, and there's been some really interesting work that some of the engineering companies have done is if we design some water storage within those drainage districts, can we, you know, we need to upgrade the main, but if we can design some water storage within those drainage districts, maybe we can reduce some of the cost of the of the pipe as well. So I think there are real opportunities as we move forward with, you know, we have 100-year-old drainage district mains in Iowa, they functioned really well, but they're, you know, over over some of our lifetime, they're like, many of them are likely to be replaced. And, and do we replace them in a way that kind of creates that more resilient agricultural system, or do we just, you know, go in and, you know, this is like a once in a lifetime or once in multi-generation uh, opportunity to redesign those systems with kind of thinking about that resilient agricultural system and thinking about both the, the economics for the farmer, but the environment as well. Yeah. And I, I think one thing that's, that's neat about what you're doing, Kelly, and what you can, the story you have to tell is you can see it, right? <laughs> so much of what we do, whether it's the bioreactors or whether it's saturated buffers or just traditional drainage, we know what's happening, but when you can't see it, it's hard to, mm -hmm. it's hard to, explain or to sell to somebody so yeah and talk more about that is do you have you had some conversations with you know neighbors or other people that because my guess is it's pretty easy for them to say that i mean i'm sure they have some questions that are around the negative side but yeah. hey that's pretty cool <laughs> yeah there's a, there's a lot of different and it, it's kind of funny to hear the differences i mean from some people that you expect positive things they're like it's not gonna work <laughs> And, which is like, oh, I didn't know you felt that way. That's interesting. But then we had a neighbor and we have a hog barn on that site as well. And so when we started flagging things out, we had to make sure to tell them this is not another hog barn. They weren't happy. They don't they aren't happy with livestock. And so we're like, this isn't that. And then this summer, it was really great because it was a dry summer as we were irrigating. They're right across the road. And he called us and he's like, hey, you think you can get that to maybe get in my yard? And so we tried. It, it didn't it didn't make it to his yard. But just being able to have connections with neighbors help him help them out you know realize that you know if you want to go take a look at it and and go see it you know you're welcome to go out there that type of thing i think um there's a lot of connections being made um and the the thought process and the understanding of why we're doing it i think that's a lot of questions because when we went to the supervisors of our county to ask about this you know the main thing for our county supervisors is get water out of the county like the tile that's the that's the goal we want it out and so when we're asking can we pump water out of the tile to put it in the pond they're like i guess yeah. <laughs> i guess i but they didn't i mean that's like a completely different world for them but then um you know our story to tell is that um we were able to go down to new orleans and see the lower ninth ward of where katrina had hit and we then were able to i was on a um a panel with a shrimp farmer who had issues with Gulf hypoxia, we're seeing the issues that our tile is having downstream. And then to be able to now say, 
look what we're doing. We're slowing it down, reduces the flooding. We're, we're slowing it down. It helps the nutrients to stay is like that full circle. So maybe it can open up minds of, oh, I guess I want the water off, but then I don't want it to go too fast. You know, I think that was an epiphany for us. Um, it was probably around that same time when, when we did this project is slowing down the water. Like our goal is to tile and get it so we can plant. And all of a sudden it's like, wait, we don't want it to go too fast because look at the issues that are going on and being able to, you know, it's, it's hard to accept the fact that you're part of the problem, but. Well, yeah. And most people <laughs> will say, yeah, so you did that, you know, what is one very small yeah, and, and it, very. <laughs> your job isn't to solve the world's problem, right. but you solve one problem. Yeah. And then that's all I, and you know, I, I say that a lot is, and I, tell my kids that too is I can only control what I do I can't control what others do but I can tell my story and if it inspires somebody or if somebody has questions then that's great so yeah cool appreciate that Jacob on you know kind of on the same note but the gap between going from um, what you're doing and when you started and put in your first bioreactor to getting farmers to adopt that on kind of a full scale um, talk about, you know, and, and that hasn't totally happened yet, but talk about the progression of, you know, from where it was a very interesting concept that you had to find somebody to do and you had to get it approved and it took three and a half years to now there's, you know, it's, it's come a long ways and talk about the progression and, and how you think we continue to bridge that gap into the mainstream. Yeah. And it, uh, when we the first one we did, we actually made contact with the with the farmer through Iowa State through their drainage school um, that I was up a, a, a part of, and so he contacted us and they'd been looking and trying to find find this uh, someone to work with this and and that's kind of how we got hooked up there. But it was very much a uh, well, I read about this in a farm magazine and and back then it wasn't really prevalent. Um, to now it's being brought to their doorstep. And I think that's the, with the modeling techniques that, you know, there again, we talked about technology to open the segment, the, the technology that, and Dr. Helmers, you'll have to help me out with the program, but, um, Agricultural Conservation Planning Framework, ACPF yes. for identifying yep. kind of where in a watershed, some of these practices might work. And, and so a farmer can go use that. I mean, it's an open source. On, it's online, correct? Um, and so a, a farmer can go out and look at, okay, here's my farm. What, what practices and run the, run the program, what practices might fit here? And that's what they do on a whole watershed. And so they're, they're being, it's being brought to their doorstep. And the more and more we have events like this and we go out and we talk about it. And I, would, I presented at a, a thing for the, Hardin County um, watershed just last week. And I got a note that because we talked about it and we had people sign up and they didn't know anything about it before. And we, so we try to promote them every, every opportunity we can, but it's just the promotion and it's getting to be much more mainstream than it was. And the biggest thing that the biggest thing I push whenever I talk to a group and it's, I would say the biggest hang up for a farmer and especially an offsite landowner is how is this going to detrimentally affect me? And how is this going to, like Kelly was saying, you know, we want, we, we have an opportunity to keep that water back, but a lot of guys are, well, if I put this bioreactor in, I put the saturated buffer in, I'm literally stopping the water like that. The, yes, that's a whole point of what we're doing here. But we're not plugging our tile. But I got the first time tile. too. Like yeah. we're going to plug our tile. No, yes. we're not plugging the tile. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so that's a big hurdle to get over. And it's still a hurdle. And I hear it every time I, I talk about this, uh, Dr. Helms, I'm sure you guys do too, that I'm not going to do that because I'm going to back this water up. Like, well, that's, that's why we have this engineering and we have enough framework now to show that it works and it doesn't always work. I mean, there, this is a lot of, a lot of an assumption game. You know, we're we're not going out there and digging up every tile to begin with to design these. The engineers are going out there. They're they're estimating where the tile goes and estimating how it runs and the slope that it runs to the best of their ability. But we're not going to follow this thing for a mile. Uh, we had a project down in Polk County that we we did and. And that's actually what happened is that the, the grade flattened out so much that we were, 
we were backing water up a long ways. Um, and so we had to go back and, and rework it. But I think the benefit to tell the landowners and anybody that's thinking about it is that the support that they have on the backside, all around, not even the backside, but all around on a project like this from the very beginning, they, they can get, they can be interested in it or they'll get approached by it if they have a, a project in their watershed, but it'll be supported. Um, we went back, we went back to Polk County and we redug that bioreactor. We lowered that bioreactor by three feet, I think, so we can make everything work, but it's, it's that you have support. You're not doing this just by yourself. Uh, and it, and even if you're interested in a one-off bioreactor that's not part of a batch and build progr program, you're still not doing it by yourself. You're still out there. You have the support. You have the engineering. And, and there's a lot of people that have the experience now. Um, or that they'll... I, I get a lot of calls from guys about you know what to do in situations to install bioreactor saturated buffers. And I, I love helping out with that sort of stuff. Um, so it, it's just the network and the framework of people and the knowledge that we have can can has really been the biggest leap in uh, attainability of these of these processes. Yeah, and you know what you started with there too is just the fact that we have to continue to tell the story all the time, and and uh, I think I think so many of us forget that we get into our you know, into the mode and we do it in production farming, whatever it might be, but to really move it forward. You didn't know that you're really a missionary in life, yeah. but that's really <laughs> what what you're doing is uh, just continuing to tell a story. And, um, you know, we all we all know people in our lives that have been really good at that. And and uh, for me, it's always I always admire those people that can stay on something year after year and because it matters. Yeah, sometimes, you know, it, it gets, uh, uh, you, you keep talking about the same thing and sometimes it's like, oh, I need to move on to something different, but there's so many, there's so many um, things we need to do. I mean, we, we still need to educate so many. So, you know, some people talk, ask me, what, what's new? What are you new? What are you working on that's new? I'm like, oh, I've, a lot of the same things and just trying to educate more people about it and, and helping, helping where we can on, on many of the similar things. I think what's really neat too is, you know, thinking about bioreactors and um, just how far things can come in a short amount of time with information and data and learning. And, you know, the more people that learn about it, the better, you know, people think about it too, especially farmers when they hear, oh, they put it in and they didn't have the water back up. But they may still be focusing on that one project that, that didn't go well. But, um, it, it's it's really neat to see the progression of things and to think about maybe drainage water recycling will have a batch and build there, there we <laughs> pro go. There project we, yeah, next yeah. like just boom yeah. boom boom put yeah. them out but um, it it goes so fast and even though you're still talking about the same thing you're you have so much more to talk about yeah. each each time you do and I think one of the things that also has changed in the last number of years is, you know, the interest from the industry and contractors in being involved with this, you know, I mean, I think Jacob's a real leader, but I think, you know, the more we can get other contractors in different areas, you know, I mean, I know that he wants a lot of uh, business, but, you know, you don't want to travel all around the whole upper Midwest. And so I think they're real, you know, hopefully we can find those kind of uh, uh, contractor champions in different areas. And I think that, you know, the work that that you're all doing from Princeco uh, can really help that as well with with you know the water table podcast but other efforts uh, also to to kind of educate your your customers about what the importance of some of these practices thank you um how often do you see what's kind of the i don't know if i want to use percentage because i think i know it's it's a dress different but what's the opportunity to continue to use some of these whether it's bioreactors or saturated buffers in existing systems I would say 90, going to a percentage, I would say 98, 99% of these bioreactors are put on existing, of, of all of these processes. Like all of the batch and builds that we have done have been onto existing tile lines. We haven't done a single new install. Now we're, there's, there's multiple projects out there that we're working on that, 
if it was integrated into a new system, that'd be great. But the problem with that is, like we talked about earlier, is the timing. Um, the timing has come a long, long ways from three and a half years for a system, but it's still not when I can go out and design a system and you're going to get me on a soapbox here, Jamie. You might not want me <laughs> go on. Go ahead. Go but, ahead. Uh, uh, there, there's in, in Iowa specifically, and just the way some of the uh, relatively archaic rules are written of the the way that these have to be designed and have to be checked out. It it not only adds significant cost to the to each system, um, but it it creates a time frame that's unattainable. That uh, Dr. Helmers calls me up or Kelly calls up and says, Hey, we want to do a system and I want to, I want to, I want to tile this farm and I want to put a bioreactor in. Well, those two things, unless you're, if you're saying I want to tile this farm this spring, there's very little chance we're putting a bioreactor in this spring that's going to be designed and checked out and okayed. And because it has to be designed, checked out and okayed to qualify for funding, that's not going to happen. Um, now, getting the benefit of having the experience of it, we can design a system that can implement a bioreactor later down the road and we can design the mains and design the tile, but not everybody has that experience. So understanding that, um, that, that, that they're two separate things. If we can get them to be one thing together, um, that's, that's going to be a, that's some government work that's above our heads at <laughs> yeah. the moment, but it's, it's certainly something that we as an industry can, can hopefully move towards. And that's the same, a different soapbox, but the same thing with wetlands and, and mitigation practices and creating availability. The, the biggest part of a wetland is finding somebody to do it because you're not talking, uh, a sixteenth of an acre like you are for a bioreactor or um, no land out of production like a saturated buffer, you're talking about a mass, a large undertaking and there's only a few places where those can go. So having benefits for those practices um, that has to come from a government EPA and RCS level, um, that there's lots of ideas that I think we can move to, but there's there's a lot of changes that need to happen first. Thank you for that. I have a couple more questions, but before I do that, they maybe aren't as interesting as some of the questions we maybe would get from the audience. And so um, we have some guests here today and uh, wondering if, as our conversation has gone, if there's anything that you came in with that you wanted to ask or that was prompted by some of our discussion today. So this was just prompted, Jacob, by your comment earlier on micro wetlands. And it's interesting because as I think about about your pond, right, if if you look back in Minnesota where I'm from and probably in, in parts of Iowa, there were farm ponds all over the place years ago, right? So we're kind of bringing that back again. I think the reason why a lot of them got taken out is because they weren't in the right spot for the new producer, right? So these producers, I feel like, want to do the right things. And I think the micro wetland has some legs as long as we can give them the choice to put it where they want it. I think producers a lot of times think that we'd like to do that, but now we have to have an engineer involved. We have to try and get this thing designed. So in your mind, what does that shortcut look like? How can we take some of the cost maybe so, so, the, con or so the farmer, so the producer feels like it's still attainable? And then secondly, from a government or from a funding standpoint, a lot of things that we fund... A lot of programs that are out there in agriculture, they will pay you up front and then just make sure that they'll check you down the road to make sure it's happened. So maybe from Dr. Helmers, what could be done to change the process so it doesn't take so long to get the funding, you just give it to the producer up front, tell them, get your project done, this is what it has to look like, and then just check it on the backside to speed up the process. So two questions, I guess. I think you hit it with what's this have to look like is, is in my mind is, What's a best practice? Because uh, because none of these none of these bioreactors, saturated buffers, wetlands, anything look. It's not a cookie cutter process. It it's this is what it needs to look like. This is the blueprint for it. But this is how it has to. But there's changes. You know, we have this watershed or this tile size or this tile slope that comes in. Uh, and I'll tell you, we change these things all the time um, because there's 
one thing that matters in any of these, and it's where that tile outlet, what, what is the elevation of that tile outlet? And when we get a design, we get a best guess at that, but we don't have it exact. And so everything is relative from that point. Um, so going back to a, a micro, the, the micro wetland possibility, what what's our watershed what is the best practice what is the overall and then we as contractors can build that what do we have to have a flow do we have to have a certain type of grass you know, I, I think it's a framework from that's going to be approved by the funding agency of what are we going to accept and if we have that framework we can build these things we can work with and and maybe it's a you know, getting back to my soapbox of a TSP, technical service provider, uh, through the NRCS that Iowa doesn't have. But if we had that, we had people that could come out and work with us. I mean, we've got a lot of great engineers and a lot of great watershed coordinators throughout the state and, uh, that that they really are devoted to doing the right thing and, and helping these projects along. And, and instead of needing the full plan, we don't have a full plan for um, tile systems or an engineered plan but the plans we put in work i mean there's probably very few of your customers out there that are well we're going to go to an engineer and get this whole thing designed i just did a project like that and it was horrible <laughs> but, uh, but uh it was made, but there's different goals for different things um and so when our goal is to create a better water quality going downstream Let's use the common sense approach and the, the fiscal approach to do the, do the right thing, to get it to work. And, but we can get a lot of this stuff done up front and with a blueprint instead of a full, this is, what, this is a full study of the project. So um, I'll just maybe add a couple things relative to, to your question. I think that uh, one is, you know, I think that this is where the batch and bill comes in that's being done in Iowa is, is so effective. And I think that there's a approach turnkey, kind of a turnkey approach in Minnesota as well, where, you know, there's maybe some entity that is responsible for, you know, they are in touch with the farmer, but then they handle everything from there. You know, that they're the ones that, that work with the contractor, work with any design. And so I think that that can make things a lot easier. You know, some of these things, uh, I'm, I'm, even though I'm an engineer, I'm with Jacob, some of these things, you know, there's not necessarily a um, loss of life potential with the engineering design of some of these practices. You know, there may, I wouldn't say there's loss of life potential with some of the wetlands, but maybe we do need, you know, more engineering design there on the larger scale wetlands than we do on, on a bioreactor. So I think the more that we can, you know, make it easy for the design, lump them together, kind of batching them so that that, you know, not each design takes a full engineering, you know, approach, but we can kind of, you know, do this, uh, be more efficient with that, I think, I think the better. And so, you know, I think that's where there's been advancements, thinking back to what advancements have we had, you know, I think people have realized that if we want to scale this up, it's not going to be, you know, one bioreactor at a time, you know, one, one con, you know, if we're putting in 50, that we have 50 different contractors, 50 different en engineering, you know, engineers doing that work that we're going to, you know, how do we make this more efficient and, and lumping that? Uh, I think that the, the micro wetland, thinking about that, just a quick response. There's, you know, kind of a new uh, effort in Iowa to look at pumped wetlands. Uh, so we'd pump out of the drainage main into a wetland, and that's then getting that wetland um, maybe sited where it works best for the farmer. They have a wet area that consistently underperforms, you know, can we, can we, you know, pump water into that, make it something that's, you know, a benefit to the environment uh, and, you know, is maybe some land that they're happy not to have to, 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 uh, to fight with uh, as often. So I think that's another kind of emerging practice in Iowa and may open up a lot more opportunities for, um, you know, for implementation of wetlands. You know, I've, I've historically been like, well, what about the maintenance of the pumps? But, you know, we, we maintain pumps in a lot of areas. So I think we can, you know, that's something we can, we can do uh, and could be pretty cost effective. For us, I think another, you know, you talk a lot about efficiencies and in Iowa, we grow a lot of corn and soybeans. So you have a short time 
in the spring and you have a short time in the fall to get a lot of these practices in. You don't typically have a winter where there's no frost in the ground. But um, for us on our farm, we do a lot of our own tile. We actually put in small grains, some oats, and that opens up a completely different time to put in tile that we have time um, to do that. It's drier, it's, it's open, not as much is going on as far as planting or, or harvest, and, and we're able to do some of the you know, think about some of the things and it's a little more efficient um, as long as you have somewhere to go with, with the small grains. Well, Infra that's where, infrastructure. That, it, infra we, it can feed the cover crop market. Yes, so, you know, yeah. we can grow rye yeah. uh, or oats yeah. to feed the cover crop market and then use, you know, yeah. put drainage in and, on those fields. And, in you know, by doing that, small grains is a different time of year to grow yeah. something. So water quality is being affected. Uh, habitat is being grown um, for those those animals too so it it all it all kind of flows together but i think infrastructure for everything is is important to make efficiencies go smoothly right <laughs> yeah i appreciate the <clears throat> i love the idea of you know how this all can work together and you know we won't get into cover crops today but it's something i get pretty excited about because you need to have drainage if you're that, doing so. That's, you know, I'll selfishly, I get excited in that, about it. That, uh, and certainly in the last three days, been visiting with a number of farmers. And, you know, we were talking a lot about cover crops and no-till. And they definitely recognize that they can make no-till and cover crops work better when they have good drainage. And, you know, I would say in, in the area that Kelly's at, it's definitely the case. If we didn't have good drainage, we wouldn't be able to do some that, of the reduced tillage that's systems. That's a huge frustration is when I see people try things for the first time and they do it in the wettest area yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. a big frustration because yeah. i'm like that may not be the best idea we we typically do most of our conservation whether it be no-till or cover crops on our driest ground it's easiest good any other questions from the audience or i'm going to ask uh another one if not but what do you guys see as the uh most significant changes that is going to happen in our industry and water quality in the next decade? I think uh, kind of thinking of a comprehensive water management. And so, you know, thinking about, uh, you know, how do we have some water storage on the landscape that can, you know, reduce some of the downstream flows, um, you know, Im improve water quality, and then, you know, can some of that water be used for, for crop production? And I think there... Um, that's where I think, you know, if we look at the potential projections of wetter springs and drier summers, I think water management is going to become even more important. And there may be more interest, maybe not everywhere, but more interest in how do we keep some of that water uh, and and reuse it. I also think of it as, uh, you know, it's a pretty... Uh, easy concept for anybody to understand, you know, on the ag side, they understand it. But even on the urban side, I say, you know, it's kind of like a rain barrel on steroids. And that's what we're doing with some of our drainage water recycling systems. So I think that's, that's what I'm excited about. And I think, uh, you know, kind of thinking of it from a comprehensive water management standpoint, may become more important. Yeah, I think that's the really interesting, not knowing you were going to, uh, to answer that that way. And I was actually going to share this and forgot until you answered that. But this morning, um, I was listening to I had the TV on in the background and, uh, they talked about in California, there was in, in January 10, they had 20% snowpack in the Sierras today. They got 95. And so you think of, you know, that's six weeks and how things change. And, um, you know, one of the things I always heard, uh, uh, old timer in our industry is it takes a long time to get dry, but it only takes one day to get wet. And, and that's what we need to do is when that happens, are we prepared to store water? Are we prepared to, um, not just let it all go? Um, you know, one of the things that Southern California has been working on for a long time is they have the viaducts that when it rains, they can get enough rain, but it all goes to the ocean. And how do we keep some of that? And so that's really what we're dealing with. That isn't a new phenomenon, but, but our climate is changing to longer periods of dry and, and longer periods of wet. So um, we have opportunities there. I think a te the going along with Dr. Helmer's on will, will be the adoption and the, uh, the value of what we're doing. Um, going back to 
irrigation to storing that water, but understanding that as the data comes more available, it comes a little more mainstream, if you will say, that uh, some of the holdouts will start understanding. And we kind of saw the same thing, I feel, in the 2008 time frame with tile drainage. Um, you know, when we were just getting started in 2008 and we, we would, we would take on any job we could find to, to keep that plow moving, whether it was 300 feet or, or whatever. Um, but they had that, they, they saw it, at that ethanol boom, they saw that value of it and they had the money to spend on it. But now you're seeing, I would say you're seeing people that, am I going to tile this farm or buy a new tractor or a new pickup or what am I going to do to for this tax problem and and they see the benefit of drainage and I think that's come along and I think the benefit of water quality and managing that drainage and managing that water is going to come along uh, uh, continue to come along with the value of that drainage I, I think there's a ton of opportunities like we've all been talking about and I think time will tell as well um, on what government looks like from here on out as well. But um, I think market opportunities for farmers are really important. Um, kind of like you said, Jacob, is if we if our margins are a little bit bigger and we have more money to deal with, we're willing to take a little more risk by doing different projects. When it's tighter, we're going to be like, nope, not going to do the extra pond this year because I can't just don't want to try that to risk that um, so I think what's what's going to be important putting everything together um, we have a lot of opportunities with funding you know through climate smart projects um, that are coming down the pipeline and they all they all work together with water air and soil and I think just cap you know just making sure we we capture all those opportunities as farmers and have a place at the table when talking about things like that and making sure that that we're opening up everything we can for ourselves and it's not just one it's not just one part of it but it's it's the whole system working together yeah, yeah. so dr helmers i i heard a while back and i thought of you um a friend of ours a friend of the industries roger ellingson has the has the statement of, if you love yourself, you'll buy a condo in Florida. If you love your kids, you'll buy land. And if you love your grandkids, you'll tile it. Okay. Um, and I think we should coin a phrase from you that basically goes the same way, but, if, but at the grandkids point, if you love your grandkids, you'll add water quality practices to, to that. And, uh, and that's really what we're talking about today and where we can go from here and, um, I would like to give each of you, if you have, if you have the desire to kind of have the last word here on the podcast, but uh, I really appreciate the time that you spent and, and the great conversation that we've had about our industry, what we're all passionate about, and uh, opportunities that we have to continue, as you said, Jacob, to is what we have to do is just continue to educate even when we don't think we have to. And that's what we're doing today. And so I'm just proud to be part of it. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thank you for the work that you do, uh, Jamie, with, with Prinsco and the, and the Water Table podcast. I think it gets, you know, many of us uh, drive a lot throughout our various areas, and it's nice to, to listen to, to uh, the Water Table podcast. And, and I think that maybe one last comment I'd have, and it kind of echoes with something Kelly started with. I think uh, the drainage systems that we put in, the water quality practices we put in, make a more resilient agriculture. You know, we sometimes hear about sustainable agriculture, regenerative agriculture. We had that discussion a couple weeks ago, but I think a resilient agriculture and the, our water quality practices can help us be resilient to some of the, the concerns about water quality. Some of our water management practices can help us be more resilient for wetter periods and, and drier periods. And so I think that the, the drainage industry is really part of uh, developing a more resilient agricultural system on the landscape. Good. Great answer. <laughs> As, again, thanks, Jamie, for all you guys do and, and what we giving us the opportunity to come tell our story like, like we've talked about multiple times today. And, and I think my, I guess, final word would just be to, that, that we as contractors coming from the contractor perspective, from the contractor perspective, keep learning, keep, uh, keep doing, keep being open to new things. Um, and then as the landowner um, perspective and the, and the folks putting it in, um, there again, be open to new things. Be, but then also, uh, 
work to plan ahead. Uh, and the farmers out there, they know, they see their yield, they, they see, they, they know what farms they're going to peg for tile. It's not just a split second decision. It's not just a, well, let's tile this 80 today. We know that, well, this 80 has problems. And so uh, this is, this is priority number one, when the budget becomes available, priority number two, priority number three. Well, that can be started. And I'm sure I'm not uh, telling a secret to any contractor out there, but it's, you know, it's a lot nicer when we know earlier <laughs> that, hey, this is on the horizon. Um, but it doesn't just have to be tile on the horizon. It can be, it can be an opportunity to work with the NRCS and say, how can this, how, while we're planning this out, what benefits can I have from a water quality standpoint? We're planning that out sooner than later. Uh, it will be helpful for everybody. So. Thanks for having me on as well. And I just enjoy listening to everybody else because I think the technologies that are out there and growing and it's it's exciting keeps me going every day to hear about new things and ha have other people that are excited about the future too and how, and how can you can be a part of it <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, yeah for thank sure you. so thanks everyone for being part of the water table podcast today appreciate it thank, thank you. you thank you